<laughs> On this current episode of Another Act, I sit down with Wendell Pierce to talk about his excellent body of work, his staying power, and on the legacy of his friend and former co-star, Michael K. Williams. So right now, you're taping your fourth season of Jack Ryan on Amazon. You're also starring, of course, in a thriller on Bounce TV called Don't Hang Up. But let's start with Jack Ryan. And I want to go back to the beginning. What was it about this series that initially made you say yes? Well, uh, the first thing that got me um, to say yes was to work with John Krasinski. Uh, we actually ran into each other on a flight on a plane and uh, we were both kind of fanning out. And I was like, oh, you know, don't say anything. And it's, it's, it's John. And say, so months later, he called me and he said, I don't know if you remember. Uh, I saw you on a plane. I said, yeah, I remember. I, I didn't want to bother you. He said, I didn't want to bother you. So I said, we missed our opportunity to first meet each other. Then I've, uh, so I've always wanted to I wanted to work with him. I think he's a great actor, man. You know, I really like the transition he made from uh, comedy television to uh, action star uh, with uh, um, the movies that he made. So um, I said that was one thing. And then um, Jack Ryan is a is a is a series is a franchise mm. that I, I have always enjoyed. Mm. And um, I've enjoyed all the incarnations, no matter how much people say, oh, well, he's better than he is, or that one wasn't as good as that one. I like all the incarnations. And this was an opportunity to uh, do an origins, something that is from the beginning and original, and we could come up with our own ideas. And um, uh, along with, you know, honoring uh, the, the prestige of the franchise. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like the idea of being a man of color in the CIA, yeah. who's a Muslim. Yeah. Who's a Muslim. Yeah. And then in my research, uh, actually meeting former men and women of color who were a part of the CIA. Mm. And that fascinated me. Yeah. Because that is a personal, that is a, a real personal uh, complexity there. Mm. And I was actually asked, was able to ask them, you know, how can you be an African American knowing the history of uh, this agency? Yeah. And, still, and still be a part of this agency. And my consultant, who goes by one name, who uh, I will not mention, still very clandestine, okay. said, he said, um, he said, you're American, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, you're African-American, right? And he said, yeah. He said, how can you still be American after what this country has done to us? He said, why are you American? Yeah. Yeah, you you have certain values and beliefs in America that you feel as though are worth fighting for. Mm. You say we both hate racism, and I'll fight it wherever I can, just like you. Mm. And he said, I thought it would be an ideal opportunity to fight it from within the CIA instead of outside the CIA. Mm. And I said, so the same thing that allows me to continue to be an American because I see the values of uh, what the country is based on is the same thing that allowed me to be in the CIA. And that just opened up an entire world to me and gave me so much stuff to play, so. Oh yeah. No, that that like even further enriches the character that you were already playing, which to your very brilliant point is a black man who's a Muslim, who's a CIA, in the CIA and already, you know, the history of this country and, and all of those narratives are kind of drummed up walking into this character before he even says a word, which is amazing. Yep. You know, I want to go back a little bit because I love hearing about the mutual admiration both you and John had for one another. And outside looking in as a longtime fan of both of your two of your iconic series, The Office and The Wire, I have always loved how much everyone from The Office like completely has fanned out over you know, so many of the rich talent that comes from The Wire. So it's really nice to hear yeah. that even years after both both series off the air, there still was that, you know, excitement about kind of loving the work that the other, you know, actor has done over the years, I'm sure, extending beyond both of those series. But tell me a little bit about that, because you guys had to have heard about how much that writer's room and how much those actors at the office loved the work that you guys were doing in, uh, in Baltimore. Yeah, you know, uh... I knew it from all the folks from The Wire who got a chance to go on the show, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just went on the show and uh, um, 
uh, several people, April, April Ryan yep. went on the show and uh, there were a few other people, I think. And so um, we were fans of the show. I mean, The Office was a huge hit. And so people watched that. I loved it. I, I, I remember the original uh, BBC uh, yeah. production. And so I always loved it. And so we knew whether there was a mutual admiration society there. You have, quite frankly, been a part of so many films and TV series that feel very iconic and certainly have gifted so much to the mm -hmm. culture and have this kind of longstanding um you know, life long after it goes off the air out of consciousness. So how does that change things for you, knowing that you help create art like that, but also how do you, you know, go about picking projects, knowing that that's the impact that your career has had so far? Uh, I, I, that definitely goes into it. It's, um, there's certain projects, it doesn't matter, you know, how big or small the role is, you say, man, I want to, I want to be on that set. Uh, to be around those actors or the performance. Uh, one came to mind was Malcolm X, you know, and um, while I had a small role in that, it was, uh, I just remember when that film was being put together. I was living in, in, in uh, Brooklyn at the time and, you know, part of Fort Greene, which was like this black arts uh, mecca and Spike's uh, production house was still there and we were putting together Malcolm X and we knew that this, was like almost like one shot, you know, and the work with Denzel and all the people that were gonna be working on that. Um, I knew I wanted to be a part of that, uh, to be a part of Selma, yeah. knowing that that was gonna be a significant movie, um, a significant story and a way to honor, you know, all of those people that fought and sacrificed so much and, and, and to give in. I'll tell you a small film, um, a, a small comedy, which, was so amazing on the set. I remember, I kind of remember what happened off camera more than what happens on camera, uh, which is Fighting Temptations. And it was the OJs and it was Montel Jordan and it was Angie Stone and it was Melba Moore and it was Beyonce, it's one of her first movies. Yeah. And to hear Beyonce singing with Eddie Levert from the OJs and Angie Stone playing on the piano and they're singing uh, a Donny Hathaway tune. And I was like, I turned to the sound man and this guy was obviously just oblivious to the talent he had around him. And I'm like, this is what you need to be rolling on and call the lawyers and figure out the details later, right? <laughs> get, but get these tapes. Melba Moore, at the end of that, while we were standing around with a thousand extras, she decided to sing a version of Amazing Grace that just tore down the house. And then this is something I noticed about Beyonce. She is a student of her craft. So she was always listening and asking questions of, of you know, Eddie Laverne and, and, and Melba Moore and folks. And Shirley Caesar, the Reverend Shirley Caesar was in that movie and asking her and listening to them. And that was... Uh, that was the beauty of it. And that's, that goes into uh, my decision-making when picking selections. You also want to think of a body of work that you want to build. Uh, I try to do a play, a television show and a film each year to keep up my chops in different mediums. But you also just want to build a body of work that you can look back on and say, uh, okay, I really appreciate that. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about that body of work. You shouted out a couple projects, but let's put some of them all together so we can okay. kind of talk about your flowers and, and the things that you've created, but you have Treme, which I know was personally very important to you. Selma, like you mentioned, get on the bus, like you mentioned, Malcolm X, like you mentioned, waiting to exhale, the yes. wire, my God, and so many, so many more. You know, when you look back on all of those projects, um, I mean, what do you, how do you, what do you make of it? Because like I said, they all are so significant and they all were cultural contributions that in a lot of ways have been an extension to, um, to what we were supposed to learn in school mm -hmm. and, or what we're supposed to get from even news headlines and, and, and beyond. So, you know, how do you process that when you think about, you know, all of those roles that you have, you've crafted and created over the years? Well, it's one of those things that uh, really defines you as an artist. It's, uh, it's why you become an artist. And I think we in America have forgotten what 
uh, being an artist is about, which is what thoughts are to the individual, mm. art is to the community as a whole. You know, at night you reflect on who you are, who you hope to be, your failures, your triumphs, you know, and what those thoughts are as you toss and turn in your bed at night. Art, when we go to the movies and turn off those lights and begin to watch, is the place where we come together collectively and say, this is who we are. Who do we want to be? What are our issues? What are our problems? Where are our triumphs and failures? Um, what our values are? De decide what they are and then walk out and try to put that in our lives. That's what the role of art is collectively, to do that, to be a place of reflection uh, that the society has. You know, some people always go, man, I don't want to go to the movies, you know, uh, to feel like I'm going to school. You know, I just want to be entertained. Mm. And I say, you can ask for that. That's a byproduct of what we do. But another part of what we do is to make sure that the culture, that intersection between life and people itself, that literal intersection mm. is culture, that that is documented, that that is uplifted, that that is refined, that we do away with those things that we know aren't to our benefit. And we uplift those things that are, or try to at least, and then maybe pass it on to that next person or generation to come. And that's, that's what all those projects you speak about really came out of. You know, Waiting to Exhale was just a triumph of black women. Yeah. And you know, they could, they could never be that ad, uh, age old adage in Hollywood. Well, you know, a, a, a film led by black women would never sell and never speak to people. We dispelled that. Mm -hmm. um, all of these films dispel that, uh, that, you know, that age old um, ignorance that, you know, our stories, our cultures, not of significance. Because the truth is true artistry, the more specific you are, the more universal you become. Mm. And uh, The Wire was a perfect example of that. There was this one particular day I was walking in New York, walking uptown, walking up the east side, and an uh, older white blue-haired lady pulled me aside and was like, oh, The Wire, that's my show. A couple of steps, blocks later, this uh, middle-aged white guy kind of looking over his shoulder left to right, um, said, listen, hey, uh, Wendell, I I'm undercover, so I can't talk long, but The Wire speaks. I mean, that's my show. That's the truth. Mm. A few blocks later, I'm uh, in Harlem, and uh, uh, this, uh, this Black man walks up, same clandestine look, looking left and right, and kind of whispering, said, Wendell, listen, um, I'm hustling. Uh, I can't talk long, but The Wire, that's my story. So you, you couldn't get a more disparate group of people <laughs> find this one piece of art speaking to them. And that's because the more specific you are, the more universal it becomes. Then mm -hmm. I do projects like Malcolm X, Selma, Get on the Bus, that actually marks and documents a moment in time of, um, of people who have gone out of their way, ordinary people doing extraordinary things whose lives and stories and acts should be documented. The Million Man March, all of those who lost their souls in the Alabama River and then walked across that Edmund Pettus Bridge and got their heads busted up so that we could have voting rights that we still got to fight for today, you know? And then of course, Malcolm X, who was just one of the great advocates for our people and for America, actually the ideas that America claims it wants to live up to. That's why I think he's a great American because actually he actually saw the worst of the country but still had the most belief in the country and challenged it more than anyone else. So I see him, um, I see him as a as a great uh, influential person. So to document those, to be a part of all of that, just goes back to the idea of what you want to do as an artist. You know, leave a mark, just like you're writing on a tree. Wendell Pierce was here. Yeah, yeah I love that. You know, one of the more special things that has gone viral this year was that clip of you on the red carpet giving Michael K. Williams praise. That was so beautiful. And millions, I, I think at this point, of people have watched it and have said uh, the same thing. What will you carry most from your time spent with him? And how does how did you know working with him change who you are as an actor? The thing that's most important about what we do 
is there's two things that will always be lasting. The work that you do and the people that you do it with. The impact, you never know how it lands on the public or the audience, but it's the work that you do and the people that you do it with. When it comes to Michael, he transcended even that because Michael was such a special person. He was so loving and kind. And I think it came from a place because he knew how important it is when you don't have that kindness and you don't have that love and you don't have that comfort in your life. So it was a great premium to him. And when you worked with him, you knew, oh, the work that you're doing is good. Mm. When you worked with him, you realized, oh, I will always remember this person, the work that I did it with. But then Michael became a friend that transcended when we met on the wire, the work that we did. And I just remembered that he was always a person who, whenever I saw him, reminded me of what depth, love, and kindness could be. He was always a gentle soul, as troubled as I knew he had been in his life. Uh, in preparation for this, I watched the interview he did with you. Mm. And his spirit was so strong and his and his uh, courage and transparency of his humanity is so reflected in that interview that I realized that was it. That was the thing that I loved about Michael. Mm -hmm. I had totally forgotten about that night on that red carpet. It was a casual passing thing where they said, you're next, yeah. stop here. And they were talking about Michael and uh, that was all very spontaneous. And I think what people are responding to is how authentic that moment was because it was so authentic, authentically true about him because he was such an authentic person. Mm -hmm. And I was moved to, to want to make sure that the world knew how talented he was, how gifted he was, the importance of the work that he does to give voice to, to the voiceless. And he actually understood power of that and the reason that's important so that you will never dehumanize another person the way he felt dehumanized at different times of his life. That drove him to some of the bad habits and things um, that ultimately took him. And he was a man of, uh, of great gentleness and kindness. And when you met him, you felt like you were the center of the world. Right then in that moment, in that place and in that moment of time, as Beckett said, all mankind is us right now when we're talking. And he reminded you to also seize the day, carpe diem, take advantage of the opportunity that you have. Mm. Uh, I gotta miss him dearly, but at the same time, it's almost hard to believe that he's gone. Yeah. It's almost hard to believe that he's gone because he's so ever present in the work that he did and the reflection that people were having and just going back and seeing those interviews and all, I just hope that people learn from his pain, mm. his difficulty. Yeah. That's a really, really important word, recovery. Yeah. To recover, to restore. That's what we want his death to do, to restore and recover and remind us that those who are troubled need us. And that's, the, that's my biggest regret that, you know, maybe I could have done something to reach out to him and help him in that one moment mm -hmm. that uh, needed someone the most and didn't know it probably. That was Michael K. Williams. Yeah, um, that was so beautiful. Thank you for sharing um, all of that with me. I really, I really appreciate that. And I think, a lot of what you said and a lot of talking about the connections, not only that you had with him, but I would imagine with other castmates that you have on other projects, I think mm -hmm. speaks to 
probably why your longevity is what it is, you know, why your staying power has been so excellent in Hollywood and quite frankly, in a town that isn't always kind to people right. <laughs> like us and stories, stories that, that people who look like us should bring to life and, and tell. Um, what do you attribute your staying power to? Because talent is one thing mm-hmm. and, and kindness and connection obviously is another, but, but what do you attribute, you know, your staying power to? Um, I tell young actors all the time, be a student of your craft. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I am here on the shoulders of uh, Godfrey Cambridge and James Andrews um, and, and all of those who have come before that um, we don't, we tend to forget, you know, so we kind of go through the same thing and relearn along the same lessons or make the same mistakes. So be a student of your craft because you're probably going through something that tens of thousands have gone through before and uh, there are those who can give you a blueprint on how to navigate it. Mm. Also, uh, good material. Always seek out good material and have an understanding, as I said before, Kelly, that every story, the more specific it is, the more universal it becomes, mm. right? Uh, I, I, toy stories, toy story just kills me every time. You know, I'm so looking forward to light year, you know, <laughs> you would think, what does this middle-aged black man, you know, looking at Pixar uh, animation, and it's, it speaks, it's so authentic, it's so truthful, man. When soul, soul was just the definitive moment of that for me. So it just proves a point that the more specific you are, the more universal it becomes. White Tiger was a film last year that uh, really was amazing, amazing, you know, how... Yeah, how far would you go to protect someone else class and um and uh, and 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 economics playing this game of tug of war and what are your ethics um in the middle of mumbai you know but that speaks to everyone it spoke to me it was just really beautiful and then a documentary about an octopus <laughs> and really uh, write a documentary about an octopus yes. that you know you're sitting there going you know, I'm in love with this right, opera, right. Right? Right. So it just shows you to be, to know, to do good material. It doesn't matter where it's going to be. Good material will always shine through and speak universally. So look for that. And then also know your worth. Don't let anyone else put your worth down. I tell folks all the time, especially young actors, make quiet money. When it comes to business, make quiet money. Mm-hmm. I say, I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. I think this is good for me. I can earn my paycheck here. It's great. It may not be the home run, but the home run's coming. But this is just two or three weeks out of my life. Mm-hmm. Two and three weeks out of my career that can last a lifetime. Yeah. And proof is in the pudding. I did a film I thought it was a student film for a weekend. I mm-hmm. thought it was going to be a short film. Mm-hmm. It ended up being a feature film that we shot in a weekend. Wow. Done by a student at my old performing arts high school, New Orleans Center of Creative Arts, Burning Kane. Someone said, man, so many people would have turned that down. Why'd you do it? I said, I thought it was a great opportunity to do my craft, do it in front of the camera, help a young student out. And it's just three days. Yeah. And out of that, this is what I call making quiet money. Mm. The film was Burning Kane, right? And the, the director was Philip Yeoman, 17. He became this phenom. We won Tribeca Film Festival. I won Best Actor in the Tribeca Film Festival. It went to the London Film Festival. It went to Venice Film Festival. And Ava DuVernay picked it up and distributed it on Netflix, Burning Kane. If mm-hmm. I had just said, nah, I'm too big for that. Yeah. That's not important to me. Yeah. Instead of saying, well, here's good material. It's one weekend. Let me just do the work and see what happens. And ultimately, it made quiet money. Mm-hmm. So that's what the diversity of choices. And then I also do theater. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the highlights of my career is the recent death of a salesman that I did in the West End. Mm-hmm. Um, 
to do that role for the first time as an African-American playing Willie Loman. Yeah. Essentially American Hamlet yeah. role uh, defines my career. And that's because I do theater, television and film. I live in New York and LA to give myself the best opportunity and the diversity of uh, experience. So those are my tenets of longevity. I love every bit of that. You are not just an actor, you're an activist and you are making sure that your hometown is well taken care of. Thank you so much for doing Thank this you. today, Wendell Pierce. I always love talking to you and I really appreciate it. Thank you, I really appreciate you. I cannot tell you how excited I am to be on your show. Oh, thank you. Thank you.